Today on the Midweek Move, we're talking about Peter talking to a bunch of Gentiles. Well, we talked about that last week, didn't we? To the midweek move, the podcast where we examine God's word line by line, verse by verse, and uh, in context. I'm Dallas. I'm so glad to have you guys here with us. Thank you for hitting play, whether it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you're at. Hey, thank you for being part of our community here on the internet because we really appreciate it. We don't do this just for the heck of it. We do this because we want to help you guys take your next step with God, and that's what we're here for. And it's taking our next step into Acts. I have with me our lead pastor, my friend, one of my mentors, the man with a glorious beard. Scott Etheridge. Hey, Dallas. I am super pumped about <laughs> Acts chapter 11 today, and uh, I'm glad you're leading this journey today. <laughs> so um, I really want to encourage you guys, you need to check out last week's episode where we talked about Acts chapter 10 uh, with Cassie Hammond of the Hub Ministry. Uh, she did a fantastic job really bringing out some of the, um, the aspects of not uh, showing um, partiality towards individuals and really digging into other individuals. The interesting aspect, though, is that there is there's more to the story. What yeah. we're picking up today in chapter eleven does not. It's not like a a new day later down the road somewhere else. This is like maybe just a couple days later within the same realm here. Yep. So let's jump into it. Acts chapter eleven, starting in verse one. It says, "Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God." Now, Pastor, real quick, just uh, I kind of recapped it. What are what are they talking about? What have they heard? What happened there? So Peter has crossed over this amazing cultural social boundary to bring the gospel to um, the uncircumcised, right? right. So uh, Peter had this calling to the Jews. Uh, it's evident. It's clear in Scripture up to this point. His calling was specifically to the Jews, and so God speaks to him that he had called him to something greater than that. Right. Not just to the Jews, not just to his comfort zone, but God gave him this vision of that which he would have thought would have been unclean, which would have been Gentiles. Right. And God sends him to not just a Gentile, but a super influential Gentile. Right. Not just in a religious sense, but in a political sense. So it wasn't just that God sent him to some random Gentile. This dude was very influential and... What happened in this guy's house changed everything. And so you would think that believers, when they hear about people that maybe aren't in the inner circle getting saved and coming to Christ, they would be pumped. Right. They would be excited. And so this is clear here in this verse that it says the apostles and brethren mm -hmm. who were in Judea heard about it. Right. So this isn't just like believers. Right. We're talking about leaders right. of believers. So you would think leaders of believers being mature, wanting people to accept Christ, would be overjoyed, would be just, man, the Gentiles have heard this word too, this truth. Man, this is amazing. Right. But that's not quite what we see, is it? Exactly. We're about to get into that here. Starting in verse 2, it says, And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them? Now, this is a big taboo. Now, we're not necessarily talking about like a political party of the, I'm political party of the circumcised. That's what we're talking about. But, <laughs> right. but these are like, they're, they're Jewish guys. These are men who are, they are in the law, they're of the law, but they believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Yep. But why is this an ordeal about them, about Peter eating with the uncircumcised? Yeah, so they don't even go to, you shared the gospel with them. Right. But you ate with them. This is huge because already within the believers and and we, we see this in Paul's letters. A lot of Paul's letters, like to the churches, are about how culture is reinfecting mm -hmm. the body of Christ. We see it already. Mm -hmm. Like, this amazing revival has broken out. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. Days and weeks go by, and they're reaching all these people, and they're taking the gospel everywhere. And then persecution comes. They're being dispersed everywhere. But... Even in the midst of all that, there is still this leaning back on tradition, mm. right? And leaning back on religion and what you have to do to maintain your whatever. Right. And one of those things is eating was a huge deal culturally. Yeah. Not just for the Jews, 
but for everyone. Eating with, who you ate with spoke to even your belief systems. Exactly. And that's how segregated we're talking about the culture was at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about... We talk about segregation all the time, but it it didn't just start in America, right? right? This, this is a this is, lasting thing. This is ongoing, and we're s- still doing it all over the world in certain ways. Yeah. But when when you gathered around a table, especially Jews, then there was what was clean, what was unclean, what you were eating, the preparation mode of all these things. Right. All that had to be taken into account, and then also the fact that. You weren't to cross the threshold into a Gentile's house Mm -hmm. and sit around a Gentile table with the Gentiles and eat with them. Right. Not only was that wasn't just a taboo, right? Right. That was like you do under any circumstances, you do never do you do this. Right. And so when it says that they are coming back at them like with this force, you went into the uncircumcised and ate with them, we have to realize that this. This was a major, major taboo. Yeah. And again, I think it's important that they're not getting on to him for preaching the gospel. It's what he did with them, doing life with them. Now, here's a question. Why are they so vehement about it in light of the fact that they saw Jesus do this very thing? Sitting with people he wasn't supposed to be sitting with. Taking a cup of water right. from a Samaritan. Right. What? Why do you think this is such an ordeal for them? Do you think it's a reaction to perhaps the... Uh, claims that were lobbied at them by the Hellenist, by the, you know, you're forsaking our Jewish law and our tradition by doing this? Now, I do believe, we, and we have dealt with the Hellenist uh, previously in the midweek move, but not only the Hellenist, but you have a lot of different factions that, again, are bringing in different cultural things. That was the whole thing about them going to the Gentiles. One of the fears was going to the Gentiles is that a Gentile culture would infect Mm -hmm. A Jewish culture, even though you're all talking about Jesus being Messiah and Savior of the world, Mm -hmm. that the whole point was do not eat with the Gentiles because their pagan belief system would infect you. Right. Right? And so when when you're talking about all that, yes, Hellenists, short answer, yes. But I also think that just like it was in Jesus' day, even his own believers began to lean back on some of the traditions and beliefs that they were taught their whole life. Right. Because we have to understand most of these Jewish leaders, the apostles and disciples, they were raised in Jewish school. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, dealing with the 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 midrash. You're talking about dealing with the 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 Pentateuch, and you're talking about all these things they have learned their entire life. They've been raised up in it all the way through. Mm-hmm. And now, in the acceptance of Jesus, it's not that they don't become Jewish anymore, but it's that they don't hold to those things as the absolute any longer. Right. Jesus nailed all the holy days to the cross. He nailed all those things to the cross. The middle wall of separation is supposed to be gone. Right. Jesus says, pull that. But now it's almost like they're building it back up. And I think that probably there are many different things. To protect themselves, I think a lot of times, even us, Mm -hmm. we can be so insecure with our faith and what we believe that we're afraid to be around unbelievers. Yeah. Because they may infect us. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Which... In our current culture, that can be a lot of things. But, a lot of things. But anyway, you, but you see what I mean. It's like if you're insecure about the foundations of your faith, mm-hmm. then it's going to make you very uncomfortable to be around people who don't believe the way that you believe. Yeah. And if you're not sure in your faith, then it does leave you open and susceptible yeah. to whatever manner of doctrine or ungodliness. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not saying their fear was warranted, but I'm saying there was that fear of that. Right. But then there also was the fear of losing their Jewishness. Yeah. Somehow now it means that I'm not Jewish anymore. Yeah. Well, that's not that's not what Jesus was going after. It's not that you have to give up being a Jew right. to accept Christ. You don't have to become a Jew if you're a Gentile right. to come to Christ. Mm-hmm. You are a Gentile. You are a Jew, but you're followers of Yeshua. You are followers of Jesus. Exactly. And But there is a cultural thing. There is a fear that people have when you come to Christ. Perhaps it's a... You're losing, we, we know that we're losing so much other things. We're losing our, our fleshly desires. We're losing these things. But it doesn't mean you give up your identity as, you know, an Etheridge. Right. You know, uh, a Mora. It's, you're still part of that. There, I know people. Oh, I'm a new creation. Oh, yeah. I have a new name. Oof. So now it's like. We're getting into some I'm heresy not, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even Etheridge anymore. Right. No. You know, that name was God given. Exactly. There's a purpose of, of reason. I hate my first name, but it was given to me. Right. Right. By my parents. 
I don't believe they had a revelation of Jesus when they said my first name. Right. I don't think they even had a context. I don't know. I think it may have been an intern who was just messing with people that day and said, hey, here's a name you need to name your kid. And they right. were like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. But it's my name. Right. It was given to me. Right. My new name is child of God. Exactly. As son of the living God. My right. name now is written down in the Lamb's book of life. Right. Right. And so... Uh, I, I totally get that, that they, there are so many different factors going on just with these three verses exactly of culturalism, socialism, right? Mm -hmm. Economics, tradition, religion. I mean, you name it, right. it's all happening in these three verses where they should have been celebrating exactly that all these things they had built up for themselves to divide one another, mm -hmm. God was bringing it down and he was leveling the playing field. The only problem with leveling the playing field is if you've always been on the high ground, you don't really want the playing field leveled. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> if you've always been on the low ground, though, mm -hmm. you kind of do want it leveled. Yeah. And the thing about the cross is it does level everything out. Right, 100%. Now, some of you guys are like, why are we spending so much time on just these first few verses? Because there's a lot of background that's about to take yep. place. Here in a second, we're going to see Peter go into a kind of a dissertation about what he's done. And you guys need to understand the frame of mind of these accusers right here. They are angry at him for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> there are people who you have to give answers to for what you believe and why you believe it. And they're coming at you from a variety of situations, a variety of reasons. It's not your job to kind of navigate all that and try to make a point. Our job, what we're about to see Peter do, is simply just speak about what we've seen. And what he's about to do, Dallas, is so important because in the culture, it was super important to log, to log what's happening. Mm -hmm. Scribe, write down what's happening. Right. We want a record mm -hmm. of what is happening. That's why in the Jewish culture, uh, keeping records is a huge deal. Yeah. Writing it down is a huge deal. Passing it on to the next generation, telling the story, mm. huge deal. Massive. Go all the way back to the memorial stones. Mm -hmm. Why did they set up the memorial stones? To live there? No. When they passed by there, they would remember and they would be reminded to tell the story. Exactly. And so Peter understands that. Why does he understand it? He's a Jew. Right. And he's ministered to Jews all the way up until this point. And so the retelling of the story is it's integral to this whole thing. Absolutely. Because it is about to put their doubts, their fears, their uh, questions, it's about to put all that to the side mm -hmm. when he lays out this whole deal. Exactly. So let's get into it. <clears throat> Verse uh, 4. But Peter explained it to them. In order from the beginning. Very important. <laughs> In order from the beginning. Right. Like he didn't start in the middle. Right. Listen, guys, don't start with the, like, if you're sharing the gospel with somebody, don't start with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So good. How about we start with the virgin <laughs> birth? Let's start there. Let, let's start with his sinless life. Let, let's go from there. Let's not bring them in mid-sentence. Exactly. He goes back to the beginning of it, of this retelling. Right, which is something that we, we see Stephen do the same thing. Took him yep. all the way back to the beginning. All right, uh, verse 5. It w I was in the city of Joppa praying in a, in a trance. I saw a vision. An object descended like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it in t intentionally and considered... And I love the fact he, he he observed it intentionally and considered it. Yep. He, he was really paying attention to going, what is God showing me? I saw four-footed animals, which we talked about. That's a big no-no yep. for the Jews. That's right. Wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has been uh, has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. <clears throat> now, this was done three times, and all were drawn up to heaven again. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, where I was having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit of the Lord told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren come to me to come to me, and we entered the man's house. Now, I want to point this out: this doubting nothing. 
It's not just a matter of like, okay, I, I don't doubt what's happening. The, the, in the context of the passage, it's really bringing up the mindset of not having partiality. You need to treat these men like you would anybody else. Yep. Don't try to treat them differently, which these weren't necessarily Jewish men. These were Gentiles, yep. like the man who sent them. So it's showing no partiality towards these guys. He goes with them. Verse 13. And he told us how, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he told, told us how he had sent an angel standing in his house who said to him, send me, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, the son, uh, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you or your household will be saved. Now, this is interesting because in the previous chapter, we didn't see that vocabulary. It just said that you will see, he'll tell you what you need to do. Yep. Well, what was he needed to be, who was telling you you need to do? Get saved. He's also pulling back the curtain a little, little bit. Mm -hmm. By his retelling of the story, mm -hmm. his retelling of the story gives a look behind the curtain of what God actually told him. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we read the scripture, the writer will write something, but then when we hear from the person, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we begin to see a little bit behind the curtain. It's just like for our lives. We can we can write certain things down or we can experience certain things uh, from somebody's point of view. Right. But when we begin to talk about it, it just happened to me this morning. Mm. I was just having a conversation with somebody this morning, and in my mind I had told them portions of this story, but I had not told them kind of the backstory. Mm -hmm. And so in that conversation, all of a sudden the backstory comes to the front, and they were like, no, you've never, wow, I didn't know that. And so it was in the retelling of the mm. story that all of a sudden these details come out that give a greater picture of what was going on. So that's kind of what's happening. Right. So what we see is then um, um, Cornelius, they were waiting in anticipation to figure out how to be saved. It wasn't a matter of like, hey, we just want to hear from you. They were anticipating, we need to know how to get saved. We've yep. heard there's something coming. Although he was a devout man, gave his alms to the poor. Right. I mean, all those things. He thought he was good. Yep. He was just hungry for the Lord. Yep. Um, then we were in verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. What beginning are they talking about? Acts chapter 2, man. Acts chapter 2. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Like, he's he's talking about, and this is where a lot of people kind of, I don't want to say they get it wrong, but they really <laughs> do get off track, is that somehow they try to delineate this oh, well, that's that, and that's that, and that's that. No, this was just this one time, and this was just, like God was moving and pouring out his spirit on whoever was hungry right. and didn't delineate Jew or Gentile. So the experience wasn't any different between Jew or Gentile. Exactly. It wasn't that the Jews were getting another Holy Ghost, that the Gentiles were getting another Holy Ghost. Like right. God is doing in them exactly what had been happening in the Jews, and they're watching it. Because remember, Peter brought people with him. Right. And they were freaking out at what was happening to the Gentiles because they had experienced it themselves. Mm -hmm. Man, it's one thing to see something, but it's another thing to see it functioning in someone else that has already happened to you. That's right. And I think it adds so much context. It's almost like the first time I heard somebody pray in a language that I knew they did not know. Mm. And I was in what would have been old Russia, and I was praying for these two men, and oddly enough, I had actually met them before that moment, and they were speaking through an interpreter, and I knew that they didn't speak any English at all. They mm -hmm. spoke Russian. And then this moment comes, and I'm praying for them, and all of a sudden they begin to pray in English. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, now, the Holy Spirit <coughs> had been poured out in my life, and the Holy Spirit had moved through my life, and I had, I had prayed in a way that I had no knowledge of or understanding of, mm -hmm. but now I'm watching somebody else experience what I had experienced, mm -hmm. and it was up to me in that moment to be like, wow, God shows no partiality, right. or for me to go, well, how dare God do that to the <laughs> Russians? He did that for me, and that's what we're dealing with with this yeah. Jew and Gentile culture. We are. Some were waiting for that to happen, to go, yes, this gospel's for the whole world, but there's a whole other faction of them that were going, no, the Gentiles are unclean. They don't deserve this. Right. And that's why this retelling of the story is so important. Absolutely. So good. All right, verse 16. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Again, point out the fact there's, there's two baptisms we're talking about here. Verse 17. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us... Mm. 
want to read that again. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Wow. Like, that is so profound. He is, he's humbled, and he sees that God is moving. He's like, if God's doing it, who am I to stand in his way? And this is Peter. Yeah. Not the natural humble guy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is more the, I'm in your face, I'm the prideful guy, and God has really humbled him mm-hmm. by what has happened in Cornelius' house. It, I mean, there were a lot of changes in Peter's life, but this was a, this was a game changer for him. Yeah, it was. I mean, it really was. His... How God uses him from this moment on, look, it does look a little bit different. Mm-hmm. It's got a little different edge to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so good. <laughs> Verse 18. When they heard these things, they became silent. Okay, they. Who is they, Dallas? This is the the, the apostles and the brethren. These are the people he's been addressing the entire time, the leaders yep. of the church at Who the time. had an issue with the uncircumcised getting what they had been given. Exactly. And they glorified God, saying... Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance of life. Wow. <laughs> like, there's so much here, right? Just in that one, he's granted the Gentiles repentance of life. They have the revelation, God cares about the Gentiles. The Gentiles are redeemable. Yeah. Like, that, that terminology in that culture, spoken by a Jew, Mm-hmm is world changing. Yeah. I I know we read this and we just kind of read it, but for them to say that I mean it's one thing for them to say that okay, God has opened up the door that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. But that's not what it says. It says that it is granted to the Gentiles repentance to life, new life mm-hmm. to be born again, the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Like God has chosen us, the Jews. We've been given the oracles of God, and God's going, (laughs) yes, in that. And we learn later in Romans where uh, Paul takes care of that by saying, what advantage has the Jew? Much in every way, because to them is commended the oracles of God. Right. They've not been pulled away from being the chosen people of God. Mm -hmm. They're covenant people. But as it has to do with salvation, what advantage do they have? None. Mm. None at all. Why? Because all have sinned, mm-hmm. right, and fall short of the glory of God. So he was saying, in covenant, covenant people, advantage of every way. Why? Because they've been given the oracles of God. Man. Right. God blessed them. God chose them. But as it has to do with salvation, repentance to life, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You ha- Everybody has to go through Jesus. Right. And everybody can go through Jesus. Mm. And that's what they're saying here, man. This is right. what, so good. What I appreciate is there was a humbling that took place here. There was a, there was a they, these guys were confronted with, you know, they're, they're in their, um, their emotions, their, their prejudice, they're angry, and they're presented with the truth. And they go, okay, I'm going to humble myself. This, this is God. And I feel like it's a big deal that we all need to learn. There are things that people present to me that I'm like, I know. And then over time, I'm like, all right, Lord, this is, this is it. Yep. This is really what you have for me. And I think it's important that they became silent. They weren't silent before this. Mm-hmm. They were giving all manner of excuses why the Gentiles didn't deserve it. But after he retells this story, and listen, okay, Scott, what is well, like what does this mean to, to me? Why does this matter? Because the telling and retelling of your story mm-hmm. is so important. Mm-hmm. Because it's not just your encounter with the Lord. Right but how your encounter with the Lord can affect somebody else and open the door for them to have a story. Yeah, And that's what's happening here is that Peter is retelling this account of, of how God dealt with him as a Jew, and these Jews are seeing how God could literally deal with them the very same way. And maybe they even had feelings Yeah, that Gentiles did deserve it but would never say it openly. But now his retelling of the story opens the door exactly for them to be able to share that truth. Absolutely, 100%. All right, verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution, this is, we're talking about the persecution with Stephen probably, that arose over Stephen, yep, right there, <laughs> traveled as far as Phoenicia, which I think is Lebanon, 
uh, Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just say that that's all for the everybody? <laughs> we did, and I think that's uh, that's not there by mistake. No, it's not. This no. is this is a going conversation. Yep. So it just goes just because the leaders have got it doesn't mean that everyone else has got it just that's yet. That's right. That's right. Verse twenty. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. Here it is. Preaching the Lord Jesus. Yep. So what are your thoughts on that for a moment? Well, again, we just mentioned the Hellenists. Right. And how quite possibly their influence mm -hmm. and their influence would be a barrier to Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Here it says we're speaking to no one but Jews only. And then here come the Hellenists again. Right, mm -hmm. who when they had come down, it spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus, and so, uh, but I don't think we can be too harsh in nineteen and twenty because of what happens after. Exactly, because this very next verse, I mean, that's where you and I could get judgy real quick about the Hellenists and these people are preaching to, to Jews only. But verse twenty one kind of rebukes us. It and changes humbles us. It changes everything. Yep. And the hand of the Lord was with them in a great number, believed and turned to the Lord. This mm -hmm. is what I want to point out. Before last time we saw the Hellenists, it was, we're not turning to the Lord. There was a hardness of heart. Now we've seen a change. There's been a shifting yep. that's taking place. The Lord is moving, yep. even in the hardest of hearts of people. We see earlier the, the leaders who were like, how can you talk to the, the Gentiles? What's wrong with you? Now we have the Hellenists who have their own set of issues, and the Lord's moving in their lives. Yep. Verse 20, uh, 22. Then news of these things came to the uh, ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go out to go as far as Antioch. So they've sent out Barnabas, kind of a, and we talked about it before. Just because they're sending somebody out to check it out, it's not they're like putting their thumb on it to control right. things. It's hey, we want to make sure this is good, this is healthy. We want to help you guys walk through this correctly. Yep. Verse twenty three. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged. I'm sorry, he was glad and encouraged them that all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. I love this. He just sees it's good. He's like, hey, this is awesome, guys. Let me encourage you to keep moving. Keep walking this out. You know, really instill in your heart that this is what you want to do. I think it's important that it says he saw the grace of God mm. on them. He didn't just hear about it. Mm -hmm. He saw the grace of God. It's almost like we talk all the time, like, in our quote-unquote tribal language, and I don't say that because it's just our tribe. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a tribal language. Sure. Your family, your tribe right. has a tribal language. Exactly. I can come to your house, and you guys can be talking about stuff, and I can be like, what does that mean? <laughs> well, that's your tribal language. In our tribal language, we would probably say he saw the grace of God, like the touch of God. Mm -hmm. Or we've even said like the kiss of God upon that, which is like God's affirmation on that. Right. God's moving in that. God's speaking in that. Mm -hmm. That is the Lord. It's not the enemy. That is the Lord. And I think with with Barnabas, we know that he is called the son of encouragement. Right. He's probably the guy that comes up alongside you and kind of says, hey, man, come on, you can do this. Right. Uh, kind of speaks things to you maybe that Your other champion. yeah that other friends can't <laughs> hey man come on get up get up get right. up get up get up maybe like a coach yeah you know sort of like a coach but this son of encouragement so we know that he's probably already looking for something good right wherein you take the hellenists and they were always looking for something bad right so what did they find something bad mm -hmm. but now there's this shift in the hellenists so is it that now maybe they're looking for something good right right because now you see that. So I think it's really cool that he sees the grace of God on them. Mm -hmm. It's not just something they're saying. He sees it actually on their it's life. It's active. Yep. It's a good deal. All right, verse 24. For he was a good man, good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Kind of the testimony of Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. A man full of faith, a good man, full of faith, full mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Almost like that's a standard for leaders. <laughs> oh, hey, look out. Watch it. Any toes out there? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I just love that. Like, I, I love the fact that the Bible's consistent. When it says this is a standard for individuals, it yeah. goes, this is the standard. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Not at all. Because we know that, you know, especially like people like Peter, mm -hmm. he was not perfect. It doesn't mean that he was perfect. Right. It, it just means that. There is a heart after God and the things of God. Exactly. 
doesn't mean that you're perfect getting there. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean that, but it does mean that you're not living your life in a pattern of willful sin mm-hmm. and that everything you're doing always has the Lord in mind. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. All right, verse um, 25. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many things. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. World famous scripture right there. Mm -hmm. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Right. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, this is kind of this is part of that whole like Luke coming out of and in, in, in the scripture, he's like, I'm documenting stuff. I'm make sure you guys understand what's happening here. And um, again, we we know from studying the history of everything that word Christian wasn't really a positive thing at the time. It was right. probably a mocking thing. Uh, you know, you're, you guys are the Jesus people, well, not the Jesus people. Those were guys in the '70s, but that's what they were trying to say. Sure. <laughs> and know? that was again, that's 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 a great parallel because a lot of the hippies. Well, not a lot, but yeah, a lot. A lot of hippies were like, they were all searching for something. Right. They just didn't know what. They mm-hmm. thought it was peace. They thought it was anti-war. They thought it was San Francisco. They thought it was Haight-Ashbury. They thought it was Woodstock. They thought it was, you know, love and what they thought was love, right. which now we see maybe was a little more on the lust side. It was more flesh. But they were all searching for something, and then all of a sudden you you see these pockets of of young adults accepting Christ. And then you see, you know, a guy, Lonnie Frisbee on the beaches of, of California, you know, and a guy, Chuck Smith. And all of a sudden Chuck Smith's like, man, why am I trying to reach all these surfers and try to get them into my church? Let me go out there. And then all of a sudden you got a thousand beachheads right. out on a beach accepting Christ and they're baptizing hundreds of people at one time. Mm-hmm. Yes. The culture of the world was looking at them going, Oh, those Jesus people. Right. Jesus people sounds good today. Right. Because we know that many of those people became amazing leaders in the body of Christ, led thousands and thousands of people to Jesus. Absolutely. But at the time, it was that, ah, those Jesus people, right? <laughs> it was almost like the the 75-year-old, almost retired white banker yeah. going, oh, look at those hippies. Hippies wasn't a great terminology in his mindset nor was the Jesus people to a secular culture. Exactly. Because the message that they were preaching was counterintuitive to the culture. It was prepare the way of the Lord. You know, right. cleanse your heart, you sinners. Right. You know, you double-minded. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And so uh, I think it's a great parallel because mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. It was not a term of endearment right. to first be called Christians at Antioch. Right. So, but that is what we're, where we get that phrasing. Christian meaning to be like Christ, little Christ. There's a couple ways that's translated out for folks today. But this is the first time we see that taking place yep. over a year. <clears throat> and that's what I'll point out. This is a, this is a time jump. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. This is a time jump, a whole year of training, of teaching, of helping people grow, take their next steps with the Lord. And after a year, we see something really interesting take place in these final verses of chapter 11, starting in verse 27. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus, who we see later, actually, in the scriptures, mm-hmm. stood up and showed up, uh, showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, with, uh, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Uh, verse 29. Then disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send, a, send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Mm. So here we have a group of individuals who they were on the run originally and they're settling here and then there's a lot of ministry taking place and there's a lot of mind shift changing. They were very much, hey, we're, we're a community that's about us here. And now it's like, oh, hey, we want to help Jerusalem. We want to go back. We need. They need help. We know there's a famine that's going to be coming. Yep. And there's a lot of conversation about what this famine could be. There was no actual worldwide famine, more like, but there was a frequent famine during that time frame. So that's probably what that was talking about. What are your thoughts on this, sir? Well, I do think it's interesting that that they're they're first called Christians, and then immediately after that, the the prophets come, and so you're immediately like our mind would go to, okay, the prophets are coming, man. We're about to have revival. There's going to be an <laughs> awakening. There's going to be all this stuff. But really what happens is 
you know, the prophets come, and then one of the prophets, by the Spirit of God, shown by the Spirit of God, mm-hmm. sees that there's going to be a great famine, and their first thought process isn't, hey, what about us, revival, us, awakening, da 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 Then the disciples, each according to his own ability. Nobody is asked to do anything beyond their own gifting mm-hmm. or their own ability. Determined to send relief to the brethren. This amazing act of compassion. Mm. Like, we talk about THP compassion all the time. And one of the reasons why we wanted to use the word compassion and not missions, mm. because some so many times when you say missions, it gives this terminology of somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And when we always have somewhere else in our mind, then we're never going to take care of those that are right with us. Right. When we always have another place in our thought process, we're never going to do what God has called us where we are, Mm. right? And so one of the reasons why we said compassion is compassion is all-encompassing. Right. It is, we're not just thinking about the physical need, we're also thinking about the soul. Right. Like hurt feelings and broken dreams and broken hearts and confused minds. We're also thinking about the spirit of that individual. Yeah. But we're also not denying the physical need. Exactly. Someone needs a sandwich. Yeah. They're hungry, right? Somebody needs shoes. They don't have shoes. Somebody needs this because of this. And so I love the fact that in the midst of miracles, signs, wonders, Peter has talked about having a trance, vision, dreams, like God is moving in all these different ways. But in the middle of all of that, and I love the fact here, this is New Testament, this is post-resurrection, this is not Old Testament. Right. The prophets come, and they're not speaking necessarily to the impending doom. Mm -hmm. They're speaking to the answer to the issue that's about to come. Mm. They're speaking to the relief for the famine. Mm -hmm. They're not focused on the famine. They're focused on the relief. Mm. And I think so many times as quote-unquote prophets in our day, we're focusing on the event or we're focusing on the thing, and we're not focusing on the answer to the thing. God's not showing them the famine Mm -hmm. so that they'll focus on the famine. God's showing them the famine so that they can provide relief during the famine. Exactly. To bring relief to God's people. Right. And I love the fact that prophets are named, right in here, in the midst of compassion ministry, (laughs) where they very rarely are ever, and it's not because they're not, but for some reason, that term prophet mm-hmm. has been put in a category that is never associated with compassion. Yeah. And to me, it's one of the greatest gifts to compassion ministries mm-hmm. because God gives prophetic insight to things that will happen or situations that will happen and how God can meet people and their need in those scenarios. Right. Not so they can say, God told me this and God showed me this, so that they can say, no, here's what God wants to do in the middle of this. And God is sending us to you. Mm. God is sending us to you. Right. To be an expression of his grace and his mercy. What did it say that that Barnabas saw? He saw the grace of God on them. And as this relief is going, guess what? That's a witness and a testimony to. The grace of God upon those people. Absolutely. Well, guys, that was chapter 11. Of the book of Acts. Love it. There was so much there. You got any last bit, uh, big takeaways for you for this chapter? You know, Dallas, I didn't even see this coming. You know, I've read this chapter, I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. I did not see this last part coming, even just until right up to now, Mm -hmm. about prophets and relief and compassion. I I just had (laughs) never seen it. I've read it. Right. Maybe hundreds of times. I've been through the book of Acts in 27 and a half years. Right multitudes of times but to see that in the midst of everything that's happening that and not to get too deep but again this was not a social gospel for them right they were just responding to what god was saying Mm -hmm. and i i I don't know i just love it (laughs) you know there's so many different things in here that we talked about peter retelling the story i think is you had some great insight in why that retelling is so important Mm -hmm. 
but I do think let's let's not lose sight of this right here, mm. verses 27 through 30. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go back in. I'm going to dig into that. <laughs> Stay tuned. That may become a THP online broadcast soon. Um, just stay tuned. Right. This is what I love about the gospel. This is what I love about the word of God is we can come to this on a regular basis and get something new. It's not that it's changing. The meaning's not changing. The context isn't changing. That's right. But where we're at in life, where we're looking at things That's and we're right. like, man, I've not realized that we difference. are changing. We're adjusting. We're, we're being transformed stuff. by the word of God. I love it. Every day. And we want to know how this has challenged you guys. We want to know how that you guys have, have been shaped by this. Let us know or reach out to us, Media Hub at thbreachreport.com. Check out our Facebook page, The uh, Midweek Move. Just uh, type in Midweek Move. Pops up really easily. And leave comments. Let us know how you guys are being affected by this, how you guys are being changed. And share this out. You may be like, oh, I got family. They've been in church for a thousand years. That's fine. But here we just saw Pastor Scott, who's been in ministry for 20, 30 years now, and he had revelation today. Mm-hmm. He had revelation today. I had revelation today studying this. Yep. It's fresh word for everybody every day. Yeah. Share it out. Let the Holy Spirit direct and guide you. But reach out to us. Let us know how you guys are being encouraged by this. So until next time, guys, have a great week. <laughs>